Where does Bob get started? All right. Uh, so real quick, so, so just again, the things that are due for you guys in the course, homework four is due uh, today at midnight. The midterm exam will be next Wednesday here in class. And then project two will be due the week after the midterm on Wednesday, October 25th. Any questions about any of these things? Yes. I think his question is, will we uh, grade the homeworks before the exam and provide them back to you uh, ahead of time? Yes. So everything should be graded already. Uh, all the solutions are online up to homework three. Homework four we'll put out this weekend. And then my plan is to release all the grades and all the, the, the graded everything uh, by, by, by this weekend. His, his question is, will we be holding a review session before the exam? No, we will have the, the review session right now, like at, at the end, end of this lecture. OK? Any other questions? All right, awesome. So where we're, where we're going to talk about today now is how the database system is actually going to figure out what the query plan should be for, for SQL queries that show up. Right? The last couple of lectures, we've talked about all these different algorithms or way to execute the queries. Uh, and now we need to figure out, you know, when our SQL query shows up, which one of those algorithms it, sh it should use. And so that's what we're, we're talking about today. And, and this is generally called query planning or query optimization. And the reason why we have to do this in a relational database system uh, is because SQL is declarative. Right? You don't say, I want to do a hash join. You just say you want to do a join. And it's up for the database system to figure out what the best plan it is should be or what the best algorithm it should be. And as we saw in the last two lectures, there can be quite a difference in the performance of these queries uh, depending on what the plan is, depending on what the, 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 the algorithm it uses, right? In the worst case, for that one simple example, if you did the dumbest nested loop join, uh, it could take 1.3 hours. But if you did a nice in-memory hash join, it could take uh, you know, half, half of a second. So, this is why this matters, and this is sort of like what this is one of the big differences that will uh, of why the commercial guys that cost a lot of money, the commercial systems, the Oracle, SQL servers, DB2s, why these systems are in general much have much better performance than the uh, open source guys. So the very first query optimizer goes back to IBM System R. Remember, I talked about System R in the beginning of the course. I said that. It was this internal secret project at, at IBM Research in San Jose that they, where they took Ted Codd's relational model paper, paper and they actually tried to put it into reality, try to build a real system. And what's really fascinating about the system R story is that they didn't know what they were doing in some ways because there was no textbook, there was no database course. They were sort of building the first one. And they had to figure out these things a, as they went along. And basically, the way it was sort of organized is that it had seven or eight people that all had PhDs. Uh, and this is the very early days of computer science, so not all of them probably had PhDs in computer science because that wasn't as common. And they sort of carved off different parts of the system to have you know, pe the, the person with a PhD would work on. So one particular uh, project that was very, very successful was the query optimizer. And what they wanted to show was people were claiming back then that there's no way the database system is going to be able to pick a query plan that can perform better than a query plan written by a human. And the same argument would be made at that time that you know, there's no compiler that could actually generate machine code or assembly code faster than what a human could write, or better than what a human could write. Um, and of course, now we know that's not true. And so this is sort of, they were trying to prove this, that they, yes, you could have a declarative language like SQL and generate a query optimizer that could generate uh, good plans. And what's really fascinating about System R, as we'll see as, as we go along to today's class, a lot of the basic concepts from their original query optimizer are still in, in use today. They make some assumptions that we no longer make, which we'll go through, but the, the general idea of how, how they're going to do query planning or query optimization is the same. So there's essentially two ways to do query optimization, two categories of, uh, of optimizations you can apply. And the first one are sort of simple heuristics or rules. I shouldn't say simple, but they're sort of hand-coded rules that you can, you can write in your query optimizer to identify certain patterns in the query plan and apply some standard optimizations. Right, we'll, we'll, I'll, sh I'll show some examples in a second. But these don't require any, to know anything about what the actual data looks like. You can just look at what the, 
the, the plan's trying to do, the query's trying to do, and say, oh, this is kind of stupid, I can rewrite this, make that faster, uh, and I, I, I could prune this thing out because it's, 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 it'll be the same. So there's a bunch of the, those kind of rules that we'll talk about. But then there's also this cost-based search, search approach where the, the database system can't figure out just by looking at the query what exactly should the right plan be. So instead, it does sort of a, a, a search to look at all, a bunch of different query plans and uses an internal cost model inside the query, or database system to estimate which query plan will have the lowest cost, and that's the one you should pick. Right? And this idea of a cost-based search model or search approach for query optimization was the, the, ma the major contribution from the system arm approach. So for today, we're going to first talk, start talking about uh, the heuristic or rule-based optimizations. Right? These are based on relational algebra equivalencies. And then we'll talk about how to do estimation of what a query plan is going to cost when you actually run it. Then we'll talk about how to do plan enumeration and, and join ordering searches. And then we'll finish up with nested subqueries and do our midterm review. OK? All right, so the, the first approach, as I said, these are sort of rules that you can, you can build inside your query optimizer to automatically you know, uh, rewrite the query in a way that will, will optimize it. So traditionally, this is usually called query rewriting. Um, the, the basic way to think about this is that it's just you know, a, a bunch of list of things that you look at the query one by one, and you see whether you have a certain pattern. Uh, and if it does, then you, you know you can apply a certain optimization. So this, again, the, the, the big advantage of this is that you can do some, some pretty good optimizations without ever actually having to go to the, the cost model inside the system and say, well, what's this query going to cost? Or what, 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 what will be the overhead of executing this query? Um, we're not going to talk about this in this class. We can talk about it in the advanced class. But this becomes actually problematic from a software engineering standpoint because now you have all these sort of hard-coded rules in your, in, your, uh, in your query optimizer, and it becomes really difficult to debug. So Postgres has this. Postgres has a query, uh, a query rewriter before you get to the actual cost-based search optimization or uh, optimization model. Uh, and maybe it's gotten better in a few years, but we, one of the, the, the lead programmers for Postgres is actually in here in Pittsburgh. He's CMU alum. Uh, and we had lunch with him, and we asked him about the, the rewriter because we were thinking about taking it and putting it in our system. And he's like, "Yeah, that's that's that's, that's a that's a, a, a dark forest, right? It's it's very few people know actually how this works." So again, we'll, we won't focus on this in this class. I'll show you what kind of optimizations you can do. But again, from a software engineering standpoint, we'll talk about more about this in in the advanced class in the spring. So let's look at the most basic query rewriting optimization you can do: predicate pushdown. Right? Say I have a simple query, I'm joining two tables, and I have my join clause where the student ID from the student table equals the student ID in the enrolled table, but then I also have this additional predicate where I want to filter out uh, anybody with, uh, or I only want to get the tuples where the student got a grade in the class. And so the, if you take the, the sort of query plan as written in SQL and do a direct translation into relational algebra, you would end up sort of roughly with a, with a query plan that looks like this, right? At the, very, at the bottom, you, you take the access methods and, and get date tuples out of the, the two tables. Then you pass that into your join operator, and then you do the filter on grade, and then you do the projection to filter out the tuples that you want. So what's the obvious thing we can do here to make this go faster? What's going to be the slowest part of this query? The join, exactly. And there's nothing about the join that requires us to, to do the filter afterwards. So instead, we can just push the predicate down so that we filter now the, all the tuples from the, the enroll table before we do the join. And that means we have to evaluate less tuples in the join, and a query is going to run faster. Right? This is pretty simple. You can, you can pretty much always do this unless the, the filter requires data from the, the table you're joining on. Right? So this is, hey, this is like, you know, grade equals student name plus something else, right? You need to have both values from both tables. You can't do that predicate pushdown. In this case, this is really simple, and you can do that, and this, this would be a huge win. So again, the reason why we can do this is because we can rely on the fact that we're dealing with relational algebra, and we know that uh, moving that filter around in our relational algebra, relational algebra expression 
doesn't affect the, the output that the, 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 that the, um, the, the database system will generate for the query, right? So the, the expression on the top is what I showed at the beginning when you sort of did, did a straight translation of the SQL query to relational algebra. And then the one on the bottom is when I added the, the I moved the filter over to be uh, directly on the roll table, but before the join, all right? And we can look at this, we know the output will be the same. Uh, relational algebra is unordered, so we don't care about ordering, right? We just care about, we get the exact same results. In this case, that we do, and we know they're equivalent. So there's a bunch of these kind of rules that you can apply for different types of queries, right? Uh, so if you have selections, we already showed how to do predicate pushdown, right? You want to filter the tuples as early as possible. Um, and in the case, if you have complex expressions, then you maybe want to push down, you know, to the different parts of the, of the, of the tree so that you do the filtering on the, 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 in the one table and the filtering on the other table, right? In general, you always want to try to filter as much as possible before you get to the join, because the join's always been the slowest part. You can also do other things like simplify sort of somewhat com complex ex uh, predicates, again, relying on Boolean logic or commutativity, associativity, right? So in this case here, x equals y and y equals 3. Well, we know that's equivalent to x equals 3 and y equals 3. And say x and y come from two different tables, then we can then split that up into separate uh, filters that we can run before we actually do a join. Or if, you know, if we care about performance in an in-memory system, doing the lookup to find the value of x and then finding the value of y in memory, putting them, you know, copying them to some buffer and then doing the evaluation to them, that's more expensive than just taking x equals 3 and y equals 3, right? That's a direct comparison on a constant and that can be done much more efficiently. All right, so there's a bunch of these kind of rules that we can apply uh, both in the, where, in, in, in the where clause. For projections, we essentially want to try to maybe produce or generate smaller tuples as soon as possible in our query plan so that we're passing less data uh, from one operator to the next. Right, we talked about this before when we talked about the volcano model, the iterator model, right? You're copying tuples as the output of an operator and passing it to the next one. So if you're passing along columns or attributes that are not even needed in your query, then you're copying, you're, you're, you're wasting time copying things you don't actually need. So this is not, you know, we don't have to worry about this in a column store, because you said before, in a column store system, the database can be really smart about only grabbing the columns that actually, it actually needs. But in a row store, you have, you know, you, you go to some location in your, in your, your page, your, your entire row is going to be there, and you'd probably be able to copy it up to, you know, to the next operator. So instead, if you push down the projection, then you can copy less things. Right? And so let's say, we go back to that example here. Here we see that in our final output, we only need the, the student name and we only need the course ID for, the, for the, the class they were enrolled in. But we actually also need the, uh, the, the student ID from the enroll table and the, the grade in order to actually do all the other parts in our query. So we, did, we can't, just can't look at the output of the query. We have to look at all the stuff that's inside of it. And so we can do projection pushdown where on the student table, we'll only copy along the student ID and the name. And then in the enroll table, Maybe we'll do a projection to get the student ID and the course ID after we do the filter on grade. Or we could, you know, we could put another projection in there before the filter and, and you know, copy even less data. So for, a, for you know, small tables, this is not really a big deal. In a column store system, then this is, uh, you, know, you sort of get this naturally because you, you only grab the data that you actually need. This actually can make a big difference in uh, distributed databases because maybe you're going over the network to send data from one, you know, one node to another because you're doing some kind of distributed query execution. And if you do the projection early, yes, you're paying a little computational overhead to make an extra copy to prune things out. But now when you send things over the network, you're sending less data. Right? And that's, that's going to be much more expensive than, than copying things in memory. So we'll see this more in when we talk about distributed, distributed query execution. Um, but again, the, the basic way to think about it, again, is you push down projections early so that you end up copying less data from up the tree. So I want to go through a couple uh, fun examples that there's a, a blog that somebody wrote, actually only a few weeks ago, where they had a bunch of optimizations you can apply to SQL without requiring a cost model at all. And what's really fascinating, I encourage you guys to read it, is that they didn't just take Postgres and try it out. They tried Postgres, SQL Server, DB2, Oracle, and MySQL. So they, they took a bunch of these examples where 
uh, you know, based on relational algebra, we know that we can apply certain optimizations. And he went through and showed how different database systems support and some, some support and some don't. Uh, so I only have Postgres and, and MySQL available for our demo. Um, but if you want to see how it works in the other systems, uh, you should take a look at that. So the first kind of uh, f uh, optimization we can do is to remove either impossible predicates or, uh, or, 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 or unnecessary predicates. So in our first example here, we have select star from table where 1 equals 0. Obviously, that's false. And therefore, it can just remove that. You know, you actually be a little bit smarter too, right? Because you know no tuple is going to qualify. So it shouldn't even run the scan. There's no point in looking at every single tuple because it's always going to be false and no tuple is going to come out of it. And it actually can just return nothing right away. And we'll test to see whether they, they actually do that. In the case of the second one, we have select star from table where 1 equals 1. Again, that's always equal to true. So in this case here, we don't need to actually evaluate this predicate for every single tuple. It can just say, all right, I'm doing sequential scan without any where clause at all and just omit all the tuples. And the second one here, this one's a bit more nuanced, and this one's a bit more tricky. Uh, I don't want to get into transitive closure, but the, the basic idea here is that the, the, for this query, we're doing a self-join, right, where we have some primary key ID, and we're saying where uh, a1.id a equals a2.id. It's both the same table. It's the primary key, so you know they have to always match. So this is actually really only equivalent, this, this, this query is equivalent to just select star from A without doing a join at all. Uh, so his, statement, his question is, what if you have a non-unique key? Uh, right, so then you, th for this example, it's just the primary key, you assume it's unique, right? We can try it with, with uh, the non-unique next. All right. Two other interesting ones are ignoring projections. So in this first query here, we're doing a select on A, and then we have a where clause that says uh, match any tuple where it exists that there's some tuple with the same ID. But again, we're doing a self-join on A, so A.ID will always, in the first table, always match in the second table because it has to exist because they're the same table. So in this case here, we're doing, again, select star from A on the inner query, so if you ran this without being in a nested query, what would happen? It would, it would take all the attributes and shove them back to you as, as the result of the query. But in this case here, the exists uh, uh, predicate says only you know, evaluate to true if there exists one tuple that matches this. And I don't care what the, actual, the contents are. I just care that it exists. So I don't actually need to put I don't, the system doesn't actually need to materialize the output of that inner nested query. And furthermore, it should know that it's going to evaluate to true because I'm doing a self-join. So we can actually not have to do any copying of, of data from the inner query. And if, if we're really clever, we can just get rid of the, the inner query entirely. And then the last one is to do merging predicates. So in this case here, I have select star from A, and then I have some value where I have a between clause. And this is, again, this is just shorthand notation to say greater than and less than. So I can say value is between 1 and 100, and value between uh, 50 and 150. And so I can rewrite that. Actually, that's, that's, a, that's an impossible predicate. Um, that should be an or. Right? So if it was an or, you could say value equals between 1 and 150. And then now you don't have to ha evaluate both sides of the expression tree. You could just, just evaluate one of them. So let's go look now in Postgres and MySQL and see which ones these actually, actually they, they support. You guys see that? Good, okay. So here's the first one where we had, um, we had a, uh, uh, an impossible query, right? And again, explain's gonna spit out the query plan that tells us what actually happens. And this is a, uh, this is a, a, a sample database that, the, that, that it's available online that mo is modeled after a DVD rental company or a movie rental company. I'm dating myself with DVDs. All right, so, so we'll do this first one. It's an impossible query plan, so nothing should evaluate. So Postgres says that uh, it actually would, looks like it actually wants to scan it. So it might be missing that. So let's run. I lost my cursor, awesome. 
There we go. Sorry. Again, we, we can run, explain, analyze to say what it actually did when it ran, right? And here it tells you it never executed, right? It was smart enough to recognize you have an impossible predicate and it said, I'm not going to execute this at all. And then it immediately returns, returns nothing. So this, let's try it now in, um, in MySQL. Right? So here they declare that they have an impossible where clause. So again, it's smart enough to know that uh, it can't possibly ex execute this query, so it doesn't even bother with it. So let's look at another example. So I would say, the, as a minor aside, the explain output in Postgres is way better in, than, than uh, MySQL. Like in Postgres, you could actually see the query plan tree. In MySQL, uh, they don't actually expose that to you. All right, maybe I'm hung. Awesome. But demo time might be over. Okay, sorry. Let's try the one now with uh, one equals one, right? And here, Postgres was able to recognize that everything always values to true, so it doesn't even bother trying to apply the, the predicate. In the case of MySQL, right? That again, it 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 didn't bother applying the filter and it immediately skipped everything. Oh, we have to see what the warning is, though. All right, so let's look at another example. So let's do the range query one. So again, we have we have a table where we um, we have. Uh, we have an impossible range here, right? So we're going to look up all the film IDs from this film table between one and two, and film ID film ID between one ninety nine and two hundred. This is impossible because again, they're they're not intersecting sets. So Postgres recognizes, or sorry, MySQL recognizes that uh, there will not be any match in this query, so it doesn't even bother actually executing it. The const table is is, is sort of this placeholder to say. I don't need to actually run this query. I can produce the result right away. And if we go to Postgres, the same, the same range. You see, Postgres was not able to combine it. And it just it rewrote the between clause to be, you know, the, to the long form notation. So it actually uh, looks like it applied actually everything and actually ran it. Right? So uh, again, there's a bunch of different optimizations. Um, not all systems s support them all. And then the, the commercial guys are much, much better at this. Let's see, we can do another interesting one. The, um, the, fil the projection uh, filtering, because I think that's kind of interesting. Right, so we can do something like this. Select. Select exists, and if you put anything here, it'll evaluate to true, right? Exist says return true if something actually exists in this, and that's not going to work. Um, Got to put a select one in that, right? So this says select on, on a, on, and run the exist clause and return true if anything matches inside of it. So if something matches it. And so that's why it returns true there. T is true. So let's see whether it actually ran the the the, the inner select statement. The actual did, did the actual projection. And the way we can do this is do a division by zero. So if it throws an error, we know that it tried to actually ride, run the projection. If it doesn't throw an error, then it did recognize that I don't need to actually do anything, and I'll just return return returns you know return true. Who says it's going to be able to? Who says it's going to, it's going to fail? Who says it's going to uh, it's going to work? Raise your hand if it says it's going to fail. This is this is Postgres. <laughs> Everybody puts their hand out. Okay, they say fail. Who says it's going to work? One, two. Okay, it worked. Right. And again, what's going on here is that Postgres recognized that uh, I don't. It doesn't need to return. Anything from the from the, the inner projection or the inner query, so it just says, "Yeah, I got something. I, I I'm satisfied." Right? 
I, I don't get details, but init plan is like is what they call when you have only a um, if you do a select without a, a, a table. So let's try this in, in, in MySQL. Who says, who says this is going to work? Who says this is not going to work? Raise your hand if you say yes. It'll work. A few raise your hand if you say no. Most people don't know. Okay. It worked. But this is actually problematic because uh, MySQL, at least in this version, doesn't actually throw an error when you, uh, when you do 1 divided by 0. So if you go back to Postgres, and you use 1 divided by 0, right, it throws an error. So we need to make it do an, an impossible thing, test it better. Another way to do that is to do, um, you take a power which doesn't actually, shouldn't actually work, right? But actually, it produced the same answer. So in both cases, it worked. All right. All right, so again, so these are optimizations, again, that the, the data system can apply. Uh, that doesn't require it to go to anything, um, doesn't require it to go to the cost model, right? In the case of joins, we can do the same kind of thing. All right, we can rely now on uh, the commutativity or sensitivity, sensitivity property of joins of relational algebra to do any rearrangement of the join orders. And this is going to be challenging because this is where the, the bulk of the time we're going to spend in our, in our queries to be on joins. And the performance you can have between one join ordering versus another can vary a lot. So we need a way to figure out how to identify what's the best join ordering uh, for our query. And the problem is, it's a really, really large search space. So the, the number of possible solutions is called what a Catalan number is. It's, it's called a Catalan number. Again, just, it's roughly 4 to the n. There's a Wikipedia article. You can look about it. Look, look, up, look, up, look up to learn more about it. But again, the main thing here is that for an n-way uh, n -way join in a query, there's a ton of different join orders you can have. So it'd be take forever for us to go and try to uh, you know, pick what the right one is. So we're going to have to do a bunch of tricks to try to limit this down. So we'll see in, in a few more slides what kind of basic optimizations we can apply to prune down our search base. And then we'll see how it actually then to, to, to figure out what the best one is. All right, so the, now we need to figure out, now that we sort of know, uh, we know how to do basic query rewriting to generate a query plan, and now we have all these different choices about the algorithms we can use to implement our joins or run our joins, we need to figure out how to identify whether one plan is, is better than another. Um, and again, this relies on not only on the, the, you know, the, the join order and, and what algorithm you're using, but a whole bunch of other things like what's in memory, what's on disk, things like that. So the, the, the way the system is going to do this is it uses what's called an, an, a cost model, an internal cost model. And this is not a, it's not trying to estimate things in terms of like absolute, in, in, sort of absolute numbers in the real, real world. Right? So it's not going to try to estimate, the, you know, we think your query is going to take you know, this number of milliseconds or seconds. It's always based on some internal metric based on the resources that the query is going to have to consume. And that's sort of a stand-in, or it's emblematic of what the, the, the actual the real runtime would be. So you could try to do things like measure how much CPU time you're going to have to, to take to run your system, or run your algorithms. Uh, commercial systems do this. The open source guys don't, because this is pretty tricky to actually uh, figure out. Typically, they do things like figure out the number of times you're going to have to rewrite things from disk, uh, the amount of memory you're going to have to use, and then if you're, if you're in a distributed database, you also estimate how many messages you're going to have to send over the network. So in order to do this, though, we have to know how many tuples we expect all the operators in our query plan are going to have to read and write. In order to do that, we have to keep some information about what our data looks like in order to make an approximation, a good estimate about what the number of things are going to come in and out. And so to do this, we're going to use, the data system is going to maintain internal statistics about all the various components or elements of your database, and then use that at runtime to figure out how to estimate what where query cost is going to be. 
Right, so you do, we'll show in a second, but you, you can measure things like, obvious things like the number of tuples you have in the table, uh, or the number, the number of keys you have in an index, but other things like what the distribution of values are for individual uh, attributes or individual columns. So the different database systems maintain different metrics or different statistics. And again, this is what differentiates between the, 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 the open source guys versus the commercial guys. The commercial guys are way more robust and have much more accurate statistics than the, uh, the open source guys. And then there's another question of like when do you actually go and maintain or collect or update these statistics, right? You could do it every single time you insert a new tuple, right? Check to see what the values are, inserting on their attributes, and then go update some, some internal histogram or, or statistics table. But that would be really, really slow. So typically the way these things work is that the, the system will, will periodically run a scan and look at all your tables and then update its statistics. Or if, it's, if you've made a major change to, a, to the table, like you've updated 100 tuples, then it'll go through and figure out, uh, you know, recompute the statistics and other things. In Postgres, actually, in every single database system, you can force the system to actually uh, uh, recompute your statistics. And I, I don't think it's in the SQL standard, but typically everyone has the analyze keyword. My SQL's, my SQL's always got to be different. You got to say analyze table. But he basically said, analyze this table and go through and recompute all my internal, my internal stats. And then that information can then be used by the cost model to figure out what what, what the execution cost will be for a particular query. So the obvious things that the system is going to maintain to figure out uh, about your tables are, again, like the, the things like the number of tuples and then the numbers to distinct values for, for an attribute. And again, the, the, the real systems actually maintain way more, more, way more things, but this is just to give you a rough idea of what you can actually do with these things, with, with this information. So just based on these two metrics, the number of tuples and the number of distinct values, we can derive what's called the selection, selection cardinality, which is going to be the average number of tuples that within a table for a given attribute that will, uh, that will have a particular value. Right? You just take the number of tuples divided by the number of distinct values, and that'll tell you roughly what the, the cardinality will be. And so what's one obvious problem with this approach, or th this formula? I'm taking the number of tuples dividing by the number of distinct values I have, and then that'll tell me for a given value uh, the number of records that have that value. Uh, it could be like data skew. Right, so right, it doesn't affect the distribution at all, right? right? This makes this huge assumption that everything, the distribution of data is uniform. And we know in reality this doesn't, this doesn't you know, this is not true, right? In the School of Computer Science, uh, you know, so at, sorry, at CMU, we have about roughly about 10,000 students, and we have 10 colleges, but SCS makes up a large portion of it, right? And some other college uh, has, has a smaller number of students. So if we use this formula to figure this, to try to estimate this, we would end up with, you know, possibly incorrect um, estimations. So I bring this up just to say that for what we'll talk about here, we'll, we'll assume that our data is uniform, but in reality it's not, uh, and different systems do different things to get around this, this, is, this issue. All right, so now we can go through and talk about how we can use the selection cardinality and to figure out what the, the number of tuples we're going to have to access uh, when, when we run certain queries. So the easiest one to do is equality predicates when you know that you have unique keys, I select star from A where ID equals one, two, three, assuming ID is the primary key. I only have to read one tuple, right? That's really easy. Um, the tricky thing now comes when you have sort of more complex queries, more, more complex predicates, where it's not exactly obvious what the, the selectivity is. And you can't just rely on that, that simple formula that we had before. So we're going to have to make a bunch of other assumptions as we go along in order to compute what the estimation of, of the, the cardinality would be for these different queries. And again, the goal here is to try to figure out the number of tuples we're going to have to uh, access or read or write for, for, for our query, and then we can use that to figure out uh, what the estimated cost would be for running our entire query plan. So we, we would know for reading from table A, in case of the, for the first query, I'm going to read one tuple, right? I'll read one page, go fetch it, and then read one tuple out of it. And then if I have another query plan or another operator in my query plan, 
like doing a join, I know that I'm shoving up a single tuple to that next operator. And I can build upon that and, do rec and, and sort of recursively compute these things to figure out what the total cost will be for my query. So what we're going to do, so now we're going to define a, uh, a, a, a concept called selectivity uh, in our predicates that is sort of like relies on the, 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 the cardinal selection cardinality that I talked about before. And the basic idea here is that for a given predicate in our query, we want to estimate the number of tuples that are actually going to satisfy it or, or, be, or evaluate to true, and therefore they're going to be moved up into the, uh, to the query plan. And so to, to handle all possible predicates, there's a bunch of different sort of formulas we have to apply to do all these different things. Equality so predicates, range predicates, negation, conjunction, disjunction. And again, we're going to make this huge assumption here that our data is uniform, but for now, for our purposes here, that, that's fine. So as I sort of said before, the, the, the most simplest one to do is if you have a, an equality predicate on, a, uh, on, a, on a, a unique key, then you know you read exactly one tuple. But if you have a non-unique key, then you, uh, you basically run the formula. The formula is taking the selection cardinality of the predicate divided by the number of unique values, and that'll give you the selectivity of a particular um, predicate, equality predicate, or you know, the attribute equals some constant. So the way to sort of visualize this is say you have, in this particular query here, age equals two, and say your data looks like this. You may, the system's going to maintain some internal histogram that says, for all my uh, distinct values for this attribute, here's the number of times that they, that, that they occur. So in this case here, where age equals two, uh, the selection, selection cardinality is, is just looking at the, the bar for age equals two, and I'm missing the y-axis, but it, it, the value is one. So we know the selective cardinality for this is, has to be one. So we can divide the one, divide by the number of unique values, and that tells you the selectivity of age equals two is one-fifth. Right? So obvious. There's, there's five unique possible values. We're looking for one, one entry. Uh, the, so the selectivity will be one-fifth. And then we can multiply that by the number of tuples, and that, that'll tell us the, uh, how many tuples we, we, expect, we expect to emit. All right, so now look, look more, more complex things like a, like a range query. So for here, we can use this sort of simple formula up above where you're taking the, uh, you take the min and the max and you subtract them from each other and divide it based on the, the thing that you're looking for, and then you would end up with an estimate of what the, the selectivity, or so selectivity of this predicate would be. So now this is a good example because it's not, it shows you how these, these, these formulas can be inaccurate. Um, using, because they're sort of simplistic, and they assume this uniform distribution, right? So in this case here, the true selectivity for this query, when you actually run it, would be th uh, th three, three attributes, right? Three and four. But we make the assumption in the formula that we're going to start from two, uh, sorry, sorry, you start from two and be inclusive in this. If you had age greater than two, you would run the same formula, and then now you'd be counting things that actually sh shouldn't be in your, in your query anyway. So you can get these inaccurate estimates based on just looking at the, 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 these sort of simplistic histograms. And this assumes that your histograms are ac accurate as well, which is a problem. Uh, but again, we're not actually running the query based on these formulas. It's actually just estimating what the cost is going to be. So our, our estimate may be wrong, but we're always produce the correct answer. For negations, it's pretty easy. It's always one minus the selectivity. Right, in this case here, the selectivity of age equals two is, is sorry, selection cardinality of age equals two is one. And then the, the negation of this is these two other regions here, and that matches up with uh, four-fifths. Right, so that's, that's sort of obvious, because the selectivity of, of just age equals two is one-fifth, so one minus that is four-fifths. So this works out fine. And again, the, so, so based on this, it's sort of obvious now that the, the selectivity is roughly equivalent to the probability of a tuple that's going to satisfy our predicate. It's not, exactly an, it's not an exact match. There's some corner cases where this doesn't pan out. But this is we, all now, because we're going to say it's, it's, it's probability, all the same uh, principles and tricks you can do for, you know, when, when we take a probability course, we can then apply to our predicates here. And this shows up in things like doing a conjunction. So if we assume that they're independent, then the, the selectivity of one predicate 
is, and you multiply it versus another predicate, then, then that's what you get the total, the, the total predicate of joining these two things together, right? So if age equals two and name like a wild card, in the case of applying now to, if you, if you apply, multiply the two predicates together, you end up with this middle region here, right? And this assumes, again, that the predicates are independent, which they're actually not, uh, not always. Same thing for, for disjunction, you can do the same thing. It's essentially just the union of the, of all the different selectivities of the different predicates, and then you just run this formula here, and then you produce, produce the, uh, the, the total estimation of any predicate. All right, so the, these are sort of obvious, uh, or not obvious, these are sort of straightforward. Again, they're not always gonna be accurate, but the thing we're really gonna end up caring about is the estimation size for joins. And so what we're trying to do is that for a given join on a, two tables, we wanna estimate the number of tuples we're gonna emit. Because that's going to be important, and that's going to tell us uh, how many tuples will then be fed into another join operator. And we want to determine whether we want to maybe flip around those, those, those joins so that we're always pruning out things as soon as possible. So the problem we're trying to solve here is for a given tuple to R, we want to estimate what's, how many tuples will actually match in S after we apply our join predicate. So I don't want to go through all the math, but basically it's, uh, you get the, the estimate of the number of tuples that match on the right-hand side, the number of tuples that are going to match on the left-hand side, and then you divide that by the, the max number of unique attributes, and that'll roughly tell you the number of tuples that will match. And again, the formula, the exact details of the formula doesn't matter, but this is roughly what people do in, in a real system. All right, so I sort of mentioned this before, that the system was gonna build these histograms to try to actually come up with these, these numbers, right? You basically look at your histograms, figure out the, what the values are, and then apply, apply these formulas. Um, but as we said, all these formulas worked out nicely when we assume that our, uh, our values are uniformly distributed, right? And so your histogram essentially looks like this. You have along the, the, the bottom the number of distinct values for an attribute and then the number of occurrences. But again, real data doesn't look like this. Real data usually looks like this. Um, and actually, typically, it's, always, it's more likely to be Ziffian skewed, but for now, that's fine. So, if we now have to maintain a histogram for every single distinct value in our table, this is gonna be really expensive to do, right? Let's say I have a unique key. I don't wanna have to maintain a separate 32-bit integer to count the number of times that that value occurs because it's always gonna be one, right? Or if my table has a billion, a billion rows and maybe uh, half a billion distinct values, I don't have to maintain, again, a histogram for every single one. So what people end up doing is they end up uh, using what are called, uh, they use buckets to combine together different values uh, in, in the histogram and then only have to maintain the, the, the number of entries for all the values in that particular bucket. So in this case, for, for us here, I, for the range between one and three, I'm gonna keep, say the count is eight right, because that's the sum of uh, all, all of these guys here. So now what I end up wanting to do is I say, I want to say I have a value two, how many distinct, value, distinct values do I expect there to be? I divide the, the count for that bucket divided by the number of entries that are in it, and that'll tell me roughly what the, you know, roughly what the number of distinct values is for, for the value I'm looking up in that bucket, right? So what's the problem with this? Right, so his statement is, uh, if your buckets are all the same range, or they all have the same sort of number of distinct values, the same width, uh, then it, you, you end up having really bad estimations, right? So in this case here, this last bucket had 13, 14, 15. The value 15 had a really high count. The value 13 had a low count. But then when I put it into the, to the bucket, I, I, I sort of lose that, that, the upper bound and lower bound. So the way we can fix this is to use what are called quantiles or echo width histogram. And basically, we, we still bucket up our values, but we're gonna try to bucket them in such a way that the count per bucket is the same. The number of distinct values might be different, but the count will always be the same, right? So in this case here, now instead of having five buckets, I'll have four. The first one will have uh, five entries with the count of 12. 
All these other ones have a count of 12 for this middle guy here, except he has a count of 9. Um, and so now when I, when I compute my ranges like this, I end up with a sort of a, a closer approximation of exactly what the distinct value count is for value in the range. Yes? It doesn't sound like you can always get uh, numbers that, that are like this because, um, I don't know, but this sounds like sub 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 in a sense. So, so it sounds like what, sorry? So you, your statement is that this doesn't always work, right? Yeah. That's correct, yes. But this is, what's the alternative, right? The alternative is to maintain a distinct count for every single value. That would be super expensive to do, right? This is an approximation. So his, sta his statement is, rather than trying to do this equith, equith thing here, uh, or the quantile thing, to randomly generate buckets. And then you pick the best one. And, no, but when, when do you do this? Right? Data's coming in, presumably, right? If, you're, if your data's read-only, then you can, you can compute a super accurate histogram. But if the, the database is ch changing all the time, right? And maybe, again, in some systems they can be smart about, oh, well, I, I, I only change these pages and not these other ones, so or therefore maybe I only, only compute, you know, I, I incrementally update my, my histogram and things like that. All right, this, becomes, this is a big challenge, and this is actually one of the, the major problems that they have in database systems. Right, there's, no, there's no magic solution to make this work. Um, and people have spent a lot of time in, in studying this sort of an old, it's, it's a very well, old, very well known old, old problem. Okay, so I said, so again, most database systems will do something like this. What's an alternative to uh, maintaining histograms? Can anybody, think, can anybody think of a real simple solution that could kind of maybe produce the same result without having to maintain these histograms, which could be in inaccurate? You said it's sort of kind of like a B plus tree? What do you mean? Oh, so, so, so let me rephrase this. Uh, instead of maintaining a history, instead of maintaining a data structure that you could then use to derive statistics from, what's an alternative? Sampling, right? So you don't maintain any, you know, you don't maintain the histograms, and when your query shows up, you go peek ahead and look look at the table you're going to scan or whatever your data you're going to access, randomly pick. A, you know, a small subset of it, and then look, examine the data, and then figure out what the actual selectivity is for the predicates you're trying to trying to run. All right. So let's say I, I have a simple table like this, but it's huge. I have a billion tuples, and I want to estimate what the what the selectivity is for age is greater than 50. And so I'll randomly pick some subset of the tuples, make a copy into memory, and then actually just then just scan through the the, uh, the, 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 the sample, or actually I, I could also compute a histogram, but it, you know, a super accurate histogram, and then find the, the number of entries that satisfy my predicate. And then I can extrapolate from that, that based on this sample, uh, if I know what the, the selectivity is my predicate in the sample, I can say that that's the selectivity on the, on the true data. So this is actually what the, again, the commercial systems do that the open source guys don't do. Um, I know, I'm, I think SQL Server, does, SQL Server does this, and SQL Server has, pro, is, has the best query optimizer, right? So, again, there's a whole bunch of other design questions, uh, how do you actually implement this? Do you always keep the, the, the sample around, or do you, do you regenerate it every, for every single query? You always, you know, typically you keep it around, but then when you go back and resample, you know, it's usually there's a trigger or a threshold to say my table has updated this, this amount, or by this much, and therefore I want to go grab another, another sample. And then this is not even bringing in transactions. How do you maintain you know, uh, consistency with the data when you, when you copy it in your sample, right? For that, all that, we can ignore. Okay, so now that we know how to roughly estimate the selectivity of our predicates, the question is what can we actually do with them? So this is where we now get into the actual query optimization side of things, where we're, we're going to use our cost model 
based on these, these selectivities that we can generate, to now estimate what the cost will be for actually different queries. So the sort of the step to go through and do this is essentially you generate a bunch of alternative plans, and then for each of those plans that we, we can generate, we'll use our cost model that uses our statistics or sampling method to estimate what the cost is for a query plan, and then try to identify whether one query plan is better than another. Again, the cost model is not something in the real world. It's an internal metric to say that this query plan is better than another. And then whatever qu query plan we find that has the lowest cost, that's the one we'll pick. All right? So for single relation queries, the, the, the name of the game, the problem we're trying to solve is essentially trying to figure out what the best access method to use. Uh, and again, if it's a primary key, that's, that's simple, because you know exactly what to go, find, you know, go look it up on. Uh, but in this case, it's often, you know, simple heuristics are good enough for this. Right? You don't need to actually do a sort of branch of bound search or, or an exhaustive search to try, to try to find these. And this is especially easy for OLTP queries because they're always going to be able to do lookups on indexes. So it really is just trying to figure out what is the best index to use for a particular query, and then that's just you know, the one that would have the best selectivity. So figuring out or having a query that can be easily ran on doing, using an index scan are typically called searchable queries, so search argument able. Uh, I don't know if the textbook says this, but this is, this is sort of common in, in other literature. And again, the, the, what we're doing here is just looking at our queries, looking at, the, at our where clause, and finding what predicates we have, and then picking whatever the index is the best one to use. And then we don't even bother running through the, 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 the cost model search that we'll talk about later. And this is, so Postgres does this, MySQL does this, um, uh, Oracle and DBT do this. SQL Server, I think, runs everything in, 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 a, in another design model, which, again, we won't talk about here, but we'll talk about in, in the advanced class. So the tricky thing we got to deal with is how to do multi-relation query planning, or, or again, join orders. All right, so again, the two things we got to figure out are in what order should we join the tables and in, in what join algorithm we should use. So as I showed before, the number of join orders you can possibly have is huge. Right, four, four to the n. So you, we need we can't just sit there and burn cycles forever trying to find uh, the best the best join order. We have to do something to sort of prune this prune prune the space. And so the typically the way query optimization is taught in, in an undergrad class in an intro class like this is we tell you what system R does. But I'll say that uh, it's just meant to give you the idea of what what you can do to prune the search base but not all systems actually make some of the assumptions or do some of the pruning that, that, that they did back in the 1970s. So we'll go through what system R does, but I can talk a little bit about the end of what real systems do. So the, the key thing that system R is going to do to reduce the search base is only look at what are called left deep trees. So a left deep tree is where you sort of have all the joins uh, on the left-hand side, and the output of that join is then fed to the left-hand side of the next join, right? So this over here is called a bushy tree. This is sort of a, a weird hybrid. So immediately right away, it's, uh, system R would not even consider these other query plans. They would only consider these, these here. Can anybody, anybody take a guess why? Besides just, you know, just, you know, uh, reducing the number of things you have to examine. What's sort of one benefit we could have if we execute query plans using only left deep trees? Well, you, you basically always only have to keep sort of one join table in your... Exactly, yes. So he says you only have to keep one join table in, in memory, right? And so this is, again, this is called pipelining. So the output of one, of, of, of the, the first join can then be fed now immediately into the input of the next join. Right? It may not fit entirely in main memory, but I'm not going to flush everything out and then go run another join. Right? If you go back to the bushy tree here, say I run the E and D first, right? then I materialize that output, and then now I, I go over and now run the, 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 the join on A and B. And I'm not using any of the, of, the, of the intermediate results that I've generated from the first join, so the, the data systems can just fl you know, flush that out to disk or swap it out to disk. And then now when I finish the join A and B, then I bring back the join of C and D together, and then, and then join that. 
right? In the, but in the lefty tree, I can try to maximize the amount of reuse of the data that I generate as I go, I go up the tree. Now, that's not to say that all lefty trees are, are pre-pipeline. Again, if the intermediate result is too big, it may get swapped out. But in general, this is this will work. So what we're going to do now is now to figure out the, you know, to figure out all the possible things we want to search on. There's three sort of basic steps. We got to enumerate all the different uh, join orders we can have. Then we got to figure out what all the different algorithms we could use for each join, and then we got to figure out the access methods or access paths we want to use to access the, the table. Right? And so the way system R does this is, is through dynamic programming, sort of a divide and conquer approach, where it's going to break the search problem up into smaller chunks and build upon uh, what it learns from the previous chunk and then you know, always move forward to, to the final answer. So the way to sort of think about this is in a really simple example like this, uh, say I, I want to join tables R, S, and T, and so I want to figure out what the right join order is. Uh, and so I have a bunch of different paths of how I can get to my final result. And so in the first path, the edges will correspond to the different join algorithms we can use. So I can go either and join R and S using a sort merge or, or, or a hash join, or I can join T and S doing either, you know, either algorithm as well. And then what I'll do is, uh, for each of these possible uh, you know, paths, I'll compute the cost of executing that query plan using my internal cost model based on the statistics that I derived before. And then I'll throw away whatever one had the, I'll throw away all the ones that, but, but the one with the best cost. And then now from each of these new positions, I'll do the same thing. I'll estimate what the different costs are to do this, the second join uh, in, in both of these directions. And then at the end, again, I, I pick the one with the best cost and I throw away the others. And now this, at this point, I've, I have a path now uh, from the beginning to the end, but I have multiple paths, and each of these will have a total cost, and I just throw away the one that, uh, that had the, 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 you know, throw away that had the highest cost from these two. Right? So I don't need to go examine, um, when I'm back here, I don't need to examine again, like, well, maybe I want to examine the hash join and, and, and the sort merge join going along the bottom. At this point, I know the hash running was the best way to go, so I only use that when I figure out what, how to go to the next one. But we're not exhaustively searching this, right? But it's, it's a close approximation that's, that's good enough. So, the, again, the three steps I said before is that we're going to enumerate all the join orders, we're going to uh, pick our algorithms, and then we're going to enumerate our access methods. So let's sort of walk through an example uh, and show how all, all these different steps. But I'll just say again, our real systems don't actually do this. So again, enumerate the join ordinance we already know about, right? We have all these possible combinations. Uh, but we can also do joins versus, versus uh, cross products or Cartesian products. In that case, the system immediately throws throw, throw those out, right? You almost never want to do a, 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 a cross join unless somebody asks to do this. So we'll, we'll skip all those. And then we'll pick one of these uh, join orders. We'll go through and enumerate all the different algorithms we could use, in this case it's nested loop join or hash join, and then we then now do this for all the other plans that I, that I skipped in the last slide, and then I pick one of these guys, and then I pick all my different access methods I could possibly have, and then I build that giant search graph that I showed, and then I'll walk through and, and then do, do the search, right? And I, and I don't bother computing the cost for the, for, for paths that I, I, I know I'm, I'm never going to take. So this is just showing you how you build actually that, that, that com the complete search graph, and then you estimate the cost for every single step as you go along. OK, so to, we have what, how much left? 10 minutes. Awesome. All right, so to finish up, the, the next tricky thing to talk about is how do we do subqueries. So again, this is another good example where traditionally the open source guys were, were much worse than the uh, the, the, the commercial ones, nested, nested queries are always, always cause problems. My SQL was notoriously bad at this, but they've gotten much better lately. And Postgres is actually always pretty good. But the, so, so we have this nested query uh, inside, inside of us, and we need to be able to derive what our selectivities are and the cost is going to be. But it's tricky because now the output of the query will affect what the predicate actually is that we're trying to estimate. And we don't know what that, that, 
the, the output is going to be until we actually run it. And by then, it's too late for us to do cost estimates. And so what the systems are going to do is they're actually going to rewrite the queries in sort of uh, in two different ways to avoid having to uh, you know, do this, the slowest thing. So there's two approaches to rewrite your uh, subqueries. The first is going to rewrite them to uh, decorrelate them or flatten them just to be a, sort of a, a single join. Or we can actually break the nested query out, run that first, store its result in a temp table, and then feed that into our next table using a join. So let's go through a really simple example. So here we have, again, a, a, select, a select with a, an exist clause. And inside that, we have a nested query. And in this case here, we see that we're essentially just doing a join, right? So it's select name from sailors. But inside of the nested query, we're comparing the sailor ID from the reserves table for the sailors table, right? So this is essentially just a join. So we could rewrite this to, to be a flat query that's not nested and now just runs as a single join. Right? So the way to think about this is the reason why we're doing this, for the top query, the dumbest thing to possibly do is that for every single tuple in the outer query, I'm going to rerun the inner query, get the result, and then check to see, you know, see whether the predicate evaluates are true. You laugh, but this is what MySQL used to do. Right? And this is what you know, a lot of early systems would do. But if you know, if you understand the semantics of what the query is actually trying to do, then you can rewrite this, and now this is much faster. So let's look at a more complicated example. So here in English, what we're doing is that for every single sailor that has a rating, uh, sorry, every single sailor with the highest rating over all sailors and has at least two reservations for red boats, we don't, we're going to find their sailor ID at the earliest date when which that sailor had a reservation for a red boat. So we have this sort of we have this inner query here, uh, where we're trying to get whatever the max rating is for all possible sailors. And again, the dumbest thing to do would be just to run this query over and over again. Um, and so instead, what we want to do is, is, is de decompose it and break it up, so that we can store that result somewhere else and then reuse it later on. So this is essentially what decomposition does. Uh, this is harder to do than flattening. Um, but it makes it actually easier for our query optimizer, because now you only have to optimize one query at a time. You don't have to figure out how these things are actually related to each other. So again, using our example, we have the nested block here. We can take that out, run that separately first, and then we'll have whatever value it generates will get fed into our query here. And then we then just execute the, the outer block. And now it's, 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 it's no longer running, running this thing every single time. It's a constant expression. We know actually now how to compute the selectivity of this, and we can use that to, to estimate what the best query plan is going to be. So you, you can see we, we, we don't have time. We can open, post, open up Postgres and MySQL. Actually, Postgres would be better. And you can run nested queries. You, you can see how it, you know, whether it's going to rewrite them using decomposition or flattening. I think in Postgres, most of the times I see it doing uh, flattening, try to rewrite things as joins. All right, so just to finish up, the main things from query optimization is that uh, we will always want to drive filter as early as possible, always push down as much computation as we can to the bottom of the query plan to try to have it do less work or move less data up, up to the other operators. That's the, the main thing. And the way we're going to estimate whether one query plan is better than another is rely on these internal statistics that the database system maintains about what your data looks like, and then uses the predicates that are in your query to figure out, to estimate what the selectivity will be, and then that will tell you how, mu how much data the operator is going to read in and how much data it's going to write out. We can use dynamic programming for join order orderings. Again, in the, the, in the advanced class, we'll cover that in much more detail. And then we can do rewriting of nested queries to avoid having to, to run the same query over and over again. All right, so any questions about this? Query optimization is very, very hard. I covered this in a, in a single hour. Like, we could do an entire course on this. Uh, I will also say, too, this is a very desirable skill in the, uh, in the real world. Uh, I had three students build our query optimizer last, last year. Uh, every single database company that contacted me interviewed all of them, right? Because the only people that really worked on query optimization are like crusty old guys. Uh, and there's all these new database companies and all these new people that, that are new, new, new systems that need a, a good query optimizer. And there's not a lot of people that, that have experience in this. 
So we'll cover this you know, in much more detail in the advanced class. Uh, we'll talk about what actually the real systems do. Um, but if this is, this is the kind of stuff you're interested in, get in touch with me, because there's a lot of research. Uh, even though it's an old problem, there's a lot of new research I think uh, we could pursue in this. OK. And then remaining, remaining 15 minutes. So I'm going to pass around now uh, the practice exam. So one of these will be the solutions, and one of them will be the, uh, uh, a clean copy that doesn't have the solutions. And so that way, if you wanted to test yourself, um, yeah, both. Yep. So this is a uh, this is the exam we gave. Pass around the exam we gave in the old version of the class from uh, uh, I think two or three years ago. Uh, I, I stripped out the things that we didn't cover in, in the course, um, and it, it is roughly everything that. It's a good approximation of everything that we'll talk about. So again, everyone has to come next week in this room. It'll be from 12 to 1. Uh, the things you need to bring are your CMU ID, because I will check it as, when you turn in your exam. You should bring a calculator, uh, because there'll, you know, there'll be for logarithms and things like that. And then you're allowed a 8 and a half by 11 sheet of paper, handwritten notes. You can write on both sides. Please do not bring live animals. We had this problem a year ago. Uh, Someone brought a dog. That's not good for the other test takers. Okay, so please, please do not do this. Uh, the therapy snake actually is real. We'll, we'll talk. We can talk about that later. Okay. So, what is the exam going to cover? It'll cover everything up to including what we talked about today. And obviously, I can't ask you a very complex problem about query optimization because I just taught it to you. Uh, and so, the focus will really be on the you know the, the other material we, we've gone through so far. Um, if you have any special combination needs, please email me as soon as possible. That way we can make arrangements. Uh, yes, that's all, that's all I'll say. So, so and there's a link there that'll take you to it's roughly a, um, a summarization of all, all, everything that's in the slides here, of what to bring, where, where to show up, and what the, the exam will cover. So I'll go really, really quickly now uh, and, and sort of talk at a high level. What are the main topics we're going to talk about in, in, in the exam? Um, so again, we started off talking about relational model, relational algebra. You should understand the basic concepts of these things. You should understand what the basics of integrity constraints. Uh, again, if you, if you just understand all the operators and what they do in relational algebra, that will be enough. We will cover uh, in SQL, right? We, I didn't teach the basic operations, but you should have covered that, you know, should have figured this out in the first homework assignment. And we'll talk a little bit more about more, more complex things that we covered in class. And obviously, I can't have you write a real complex SQL query, because one, that would be painful to write you know, with, a, with a pen and paper. Uh, and also, it would be difficult for us to actually test this. So this should be sort of obvious what I mean. When, yeah, it's sort of obvious what I'm trying to say here. Like, we're not going to ask you super hard questions on SQL. Um, Again, so then we're going to talk about more. Uh, we'll, we'll cover the storage thing. So, we, so you guys built a buffer pool manager in the first project. So we'll cover all the different uh, management policies you can have for how to swap things in and out. We'll talk about how you can organize the data on disk. What do the pages look like? What do heaps look like? How can you organize your heaps? Um, and I guess the most important thing is you, you should understand at a high level what are the trade-offs between these different storage models. Right, that you know, of you know, of doing pages one way versus another, doing heaps one way versus another. We covered a little bit about the LSMs, right? Again, at a high level, you know, what what are the advantages and disadvantages of these different approaches? Then we spent time talking about hashing. We talked about extendable hashing, linear hashing. Uh, we talked about the the open address hashing, cuckoo hashing, um, chain hashing. All of those things will be covered in 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 the in the, in the, uh, in the exam. And then roughly, you know, what are the, the benefits or trade-offs between using a hash table versus a, a you know, order-preserving tree? For tree indexes, we've spent most of our time talking about B plus trees. And then the, the, the homework, the project was based on B plus trees. The homework was on B, on B plus trees. Uh, but we also talk, talked a little bit about radix trees and skip lists. Again, think of it in terms of like, I care more about you understanding at a high level what these data structures look like and when, when is one better than another? 
For sort sorting, we talked about two-way external merge sort, general merge sort, and sort of like in the last homework assignment, or the current homework assignment, being able to figure out, you know, if you have a certain number of buffers and your data look is this big, how, you know, what would the cost be to actually sort this? Then we talk about query processing. Uh, again, the advantages and disadvantages of the iterator model versus the materialization model versus the vector vectorization model. We talked about join algorithms, nested loops, sort merge, and hashing. Again, you should be able to, to, like in the homework assignment, if you give you, you have this many buffers and your data has this, this many pages, what will be the cost of, the I.O. cost of executing these different join algorithms? And then we talked a little bit today about query optimization and planning. Again, at a high level, understand you know, what the selectivity is of, of a query or what the, the cardinality is for, for di different predicates. Any questions? So on the, on the, the link on the website for the, the midterm exam guide, uh, there's a link to the, the textbook webpage uh, from the Yale guys, and they have the solutions to some of the practice questions. And I've listed out exactly what all the chapters we will cover. OK? All right, so what do you need to bring next week? CMUID, calculator, cheat sheet, oh, note sheet, right? Uh, what should you not bring? Live animals, yes, OK. You think I didn't have to say this, but you have to say this, OK. All right, so uh, on Monday, again, Monday's class will not, be, uh, will not be included in the exam. On Monday's class, we start talking about how to do parallel query execution. So now we know the algorithms. We know how to pick good query plans. Now we can talk about how, what optimizations we can do in the system to take advantage of extra cores. And so the, the difference between parallel query execution and distributed execution, the way I define it is parallel query execution is we're still going to hang out on a single box, on a single server. And we say, how can we have queries run in parallel using different cores? And when we talk about distributed, that'll be multiple machines. Okay? All right, guys. Have a good weekend. I'll see you on Monday.